All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being on time. It's weird to be in the classroom. We haven't been in the classroom in like forever. Every time I say that, I want to start say forever, forever, ever, forever, ever. Uh, all right. Sorry, Miss Jackson. All right. Let's um, bring it back. So uh, as usual, class is a dynamic, ever-changing uh, thing here in herpetology. So I want to uh, acknowledge that class is often um, hodgepodge of different activities and changing at the last minute. And I want to acknowledge all of you for being flexible and dynamic in that regard. Um, I'm trying to make things happen as they can. And as you know, based on weather and other contingencies, things aren't always like planable ahead of time. So I'm just acknowledging that this class has been um, uh, beautifully unstructured this semester. And that for some of us, that's easier than others. So for those of you who like a lot of structure, uh, and it's been a little bit of a challenge. I'm acknowledging that and uh, you know, just acknowledging that my intention is to give you as much advanced notice about things as possible, but also make things happen so that we can make them happen. So it's been great. It's been great so far this semester. I'm thrilled we've been able to get out on a couple of trips last week. Uh, we're gonna debrief some of those trips today and some other topics to cover. Uh, but first we have a special uh, demonstration related to functional morphology. And I'm going to, actually, I'll turn this computer around to see if I can record this for people that are going to watch the video. Uh, it's not going to be great, but it'll be better than nothing. And I'm going to let Ethan take it away, and I'm going to run downstairs and grab that yep. bin for us right now. Then. Uh oh. Should everyone stand up and go over there? Uh, I was thinking we could do this and like visit each table, but I guess since there's part of the class in advance, we're doing two tables. You could probably do it. If people that are close by stay seated and people stand up behind them, and then some people can stand on the yeah. table. So we've got a special demonstration with, and you won't see the, I'm specifically doing this, you don't see the animals yet, but we've got three lizards here called sandfish games, and they are highly, highly specialized. We'll start over here, I guess. People in this area want to come over and see that working and living in the sand and specifically diving and swimming in the sand. So this first demonstration is going to be, and I'll come over to this table afterwards, but this first demonstration is going to be them diving into the sand. And these guys, well, you'll see, and like after I show you, but so over here. <laughs> Feel free to get up and stick around. There's a wizard in this bin. But we have two more. They're called sandfish skinks. Sand skinks. <laughs> now we've got one more. And we'll just up front in case anybody who didn't see it wants to come up and see it. <laughs> these guys, these guys can disappear under the sand in less than a second if they want to. So what you saw is actually pretty slow for them. Anybody else needs to see it coming up? If you have it, if you want to record a video, come on up. Come on up. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you run your hands to the sand until you find you've hit a body and you grab it out. Here's a better one. Yeah, so these guys have highly, highly specialized morphology. You see the flanges on their toes there, that's to grab sand better. Wow. I can bring them around for everybody. <laughs> Oh, so cute. Oh, so cute. Oh, so the wedge shot, wedge shaped head. Are you even proud of these guys? They're so special. They're so they're uh, Saharan Africa into the Middle East. 
Okay. No, not no, nowhere close. Yep, I can actually pull up. Okay, I'll do this. And these guys, you would think that they would dig with the sand and everything with their hands, but they actually undulate through the sand. And on top of that, they found that each lizard has its own undulation pattern and frequency of swimming to create the least amount of friction possible to swing through the sand. And there's a lot we still don't understand about these guys. There's a few things we do like there. How their morphology helps them. Did you guys see? One of the things we understand, and I'll show you here, is let me grab them here. The difference in color that occurs in these individuals. So we have a bright yellow and black, and then a brown and orange. And additionally, we don't have one here, but there's also ones that just occur as a flat brown. And we don't know why yet. There'll be some research into that later, probably in a year or so. Well, we thought at first it was sexual, um, some sexual difference in that the females are dark brown and the males are bright yellow and black. At some point, the males go from that orange and brown to a dark black. However, just recently, and just actually talking to like somebody who keeps these guys, there has been individuals with the orange and brown laying eggs. So we don't know now the difference, but then there's some things like right below, I can show you guys here with this big guy actually, and bring him back around. That, right underneath their eye is a very prominent yellow scale. And this is something that we found on the bright, you can see right there, on the bright yellow and blacks, but then also on a few individuals that are yellow and brown as well. So possibly it could be that the yellow and brown is a stage for both males and females, but then their eye pattern is the one that determines it. So there's no proof of this yet. We still like actually come the way to even like probing them, find out if they're male or female. And I'll just jump in real quick to Chase asked the question, where are these guys from? I pulled up a range map here, and they're all in the genus uh, Spicus. Uh, and you can see several species within that genus in their range here. So these guys are Spicus Spicus, which is fun to say. Yeah. Uh, you can see across the Sahara of Northern Africa, through Egypt, and into the Middle East a little bit here, and overlaps with this other species. And there's a couple other close related species kind of through the Arabian Peninsula there. Yeah. Uh, so and, nowhere close to here. Yeah, and all these guys are super, super in the study. These guys, Skinkus, Skinkus, and then Skinkus, Abelfascius, the Western, or the, yeah, the Western sand skink are probably the best understood, but even then, like I said, not even knowing their gender, super understood. There's even one species, the Skinkus hempery kind you can see in purple, that's the giant sandfish. It's about double the weight and size of these guys. They, there's only like one record of them, and that's it in the scientific record. So, wow. Yeah. Demonstrate the sprinting and then. Oh, yeah, we do sprinting. Yeah, yeah. SK, go ahead. Yeah. And Sam. Uh, we actually had them, we got them from an importer who got them from Egypt and they were imported into the US and then we got them from them. Yeah. These, are, these guys used to be really common in the pet trade back in the early to late 2000s, but since then they've kind of died off and there's only a few keepers left in the US. Pardon me, but some people still like to get them imported in and it's through them that we can get them in. Yeah. You mentioned the giant sandfish yeah. only has like one method. Then how are we able to like determine the nature of that? Uh, that wasn't our work. That was by I'm a- I'm not saying you guys are- Yeah, yeah. Like I think that was, I, I've talked briefly with the, the, the researcher that this work, this is from an overall work on their uh, genetics and where each species falls. And you can see the phylogeny up there actually. Yeah. Ethan, when you say there's only one record, you mean one like paper, one scientific study? Yeah, that's just kind of saying that they exist. Okay. Yeah. So, and so that does it. That means that there might be records of like, hey, these guys exist in these places, but there are just no like actual research papers published about yeah. them, even as there's like locality. I was saying, if you yeah. Google search it, there's a lot of people that keep those pets. Yeah. The only people that I know the keep them. Yeah. The only people that I know keep them, and I'm actually in contact with some are, pe are people in Japan that keep them. And they're actually where we've gotten a lot of re information about the sandfish as well, because there's a big community of keepers over there. 
but yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's do this. The, sure. this, this so we're here. gonna do the same thing we did with the Bernardus Morales, putting them down the track. And this is actually gonna be our first time racing these yeah, guys. This is new. This, this has not been yeah. done before, but through some initial observations. And who is our, I, I apologize, I don't recall, who is the expert? Was he touching me to the Yeah, Sam, are you, are you game? Yeah. You, can you handle Sphinx? Yes, I can. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 why don't you guys do that? You'll uh, see. Sam, and if you can hand us that bin, or Captain. No, I was just a regular. Captain, would you mind handing us that bin? Yeah, yeah. but they'll shut their skin. Uh, yeah. 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 This is on this guy as well. Well, as we're erasing him, that there is a little green, orange, gold square in his back. That's actually a data logger. So this, we put these on these guys, uh, and this records their temperature as they go into the day. That way we can figure out there, because we don't even know what temperature these guys like to sit at throughout the day. So it's a lot of estimation and guesswork. So we're trying to figure out what they like to do. Um, we have the paintbrush, we're going to do it. Uh, uh, we don't. Yeah. I didn't bring the paintbrush, but what? I don't think we'll need it. We can chase it with our hand. Okay. Be ready because these guys. Yeah, are get a video easy. of this. Actually, this is the first time we've done this. So. Oh. And something about these guys too is that they always want to be thinking and bury themselves. They're kind of like you think of like an ostrich. So anywhere else, that's a forehead, he will look at that. A big trouble issue with making this so far has been getting the sand shallow enough that they'll run, but not deep enough that they'll dive down. How deep do they usually go down? If there's enough to even submerge their eyes, so about two to three centimeters, they'll dive down. Are they like, can they do well without sand? Because he doesn't really seem like he can move very well. No, so I've seen some people before that keep them without sand, keep them without sand, but they don't do well. It's kind of like, Having an animal, like if you didn't have like some of the high and deep stress. Aww. Some animals usually use that with like a hide or something like that. You guys only use the sand. Mm -hmm. You can see even on these side bits here, where it's deep enough for it to bury his head, it'll start burying his head. And even when they're out of the sand on like a hard plastic surface, they'll walk around tapping their heads on the ground and trying to bury themselves. <laughs> so just to add on to what Ethan is talking about, here's some example data from our test of the, the data logger on the lizard. And this shows its body temperature throughout the day, right? And so this is a cycle of several days. And up top here is about 40 degrees Celsius. This is roughly 100, 100 plus degrees Fahrenheit, down to about 20 degrees uh, Celsius, which is about room temperature. We have their their lamps in their in their enclosures on a cycle so that it cools down at night and then warms up during the day. But during the day, there's a gradient in there, right? So they can choose kind of how warm they want to be. And you can see that the lizard is thermoregulating, kind of letting itself get warmer and cooler throughout the day. And so we're interested in these patterns here. This is just some test data to, to make sure everything is working. You can see it's pretty intriguing that the animal is actively changing its body temperature throughout the day. So we're pretty excited to, to unpack that a little more. I want to see, actually have to watch this. <laughs> so you can see even here, that's just like, that's like two yeah. centimeters and he is acting like it's not the big. He's going to tuck around. I think these guys are going to tucker themselves out oh. real quick. I would be surprised if they didn't have a very high cost of locomotion. Anyone that's ever tried to run on like loose sand on the beach, for example, you know how really difficult that is. And that's why these guys have seems like a Yeah, they do have adaptations. That's where those fringes on the toes come in handy. That allows them to act like a shuttle with their hands, grabbing more sand, getting more. So you haven't done this. In this yet. Have you done run them at all on sandpaper or something like that? No, and there's actually a good reason for not doing them on sandpaper specifically, and that's because of these print flanges on their toes, and because that's a specific adaptation for running on like loose sand. So when you run them on sandpaper, you're going to lose a bit of that purpose and grip for it. It's not, it won't do anything, any harm to them or anything, but it will allow them to run as well as they naturally would on loose sand. It's kind of that game and what gives them to push off the button. That makes any sense. Oh my god! 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 Oh
<laughs> One other thing that I'll add about their special morphological adaptations environment, we can't see this, but what's really cool, uh, Ethan, I read some papers about this, is the way that their lungs and airways are structured. When they inhale, the air. Um, this is specifically what I understand too. Yeah, the air circulates in such a way that it creates a low pressure zone and then is brought into the lungs. And so what happens is as they're underground, if they inhale any sand, and when the air gets uh, uh, experiences this turbulence and there's this low pressure area, that sand falls down and it falls into their digestive tract where it can get safely swallowed and pooped out. And they, their poop is what, some 50% sand or something yeah. like that? Um, and it doesn't go into their lungs. And they dissected lizards that live in this skin. They live underground in the sand and there's zero grains of sand in their lungs. So this really efficient way to be able to breathe underground, it's like a built-in filtration system. The sand goes out and, and goes harmlessly through the digestive tract. Here's a little breathe. diagram of it. Oh yeah, yeah. So I think it's something like this. So this is the sphinx nose right here, and this is their mouth. Um, so this is di their digestive tract at the bottom, and this is their nasal airway tract up top. And when they are breathing, the sand will, the air in with sand in it will come in through here. And due to this loop here, this overarching thing, it will cause the sand to fall out so clean air can just go into the lungs itself. And they've actually done a couple of dissections of these guys, and they've never found a single grain of sand in any of their lungs, despite spending about 90% of their lives underneath sand breathing. And they'll even do a little thing too when they're underneath the sand where their breathing style changes and it's almost like a sneeze out every time they mm -hmm. breathe as well, getting any extra out. What do they eat? So that's another big thing is, so it would be assumed like most skinks and most lizards, they are insectivores. And that was my information as well from some of the people I talked with in Japan is that these guys are insectivores, insects, anything you'll give them. However, I learned from some people in, up in Detroit, in the Detroit area, that they had been keeping theirs with their pancake tortoises, which is really type of flat, uh, this really flat type of tortoise lives in the deserts of America, so different environments, but they're keeping together due to like cleaning out the skin enclosure. And while in the skin, while in the tortoise enclosure, they actually observed them eating leafy greens. Um, and then on top of this as well, we recently found a paper um, looking into the diet of these skinks as well, and they actually found that 50% of their diet is leafy green and seeds. With 50%? About that, yeah. So in actuality, these guys are omnivores. However, that was a short study. They do need to be looked at long term. But from what we can tell, they seem to be opportunistic omnivores. So what did they get fed here? Here, we originally feed them crickets, things like uh, mealworms, mealworm beetles. Um, but now we're offering as well lentils, um, like a, a leafy salad mix as well. Um, but these guys will eat anything, anything really moving either, too. They've even noted uh, lizards chasing dead leaves across sandhills as well as they were blowing in the wind. <laughs> and it's likely that, and we, don't, we didn't know this either, and we still don't know this for sure, but from initial observations, it seems that movement plays a big role in their hunting. And you can look on the video of these guys and it will show them in the, in the night actually in the desert. It's like some National Geographic video, um, hunting after things moving underneath the sand, but that's completely wrong. Um, what they showed isn't in actuality at all how these things operate. Through some uh, video observations, we've had video cameras set up with these guys as they're going throughout the day. These guys actually emerge around 10 to 12 in the morning right before it gets to the hottest of the day. And the rest of the day, you'll see, so I'm going to show you here. So, from this point to this point, they'll be active during the day. And the rest of the day is spent building up energy to survive the, the drop off in temperature overnight. Because in the Sahara, temperatures can, temperatures can super drop. And if they, and it could freeze an animal technically. Um, but by living in the sand, as these guys do, they take advantage of a unique microhabitat. And I don't know, are we gonna talk about like thermal microhabitats and stuff? Yes, next time class, yep. Yep, so we'll talk about that next. But the sand offers a very unique thermal microhabitat because the sand, as the day goes, will store up thermal energy as it heats up. And this allows a nice fluid, I'll draw it over here, a nice fluid 
A nice fluid temperature gradient. So we have the top of the sand here. And then as you go down, you would think the temperature would drop. However, it actually goes down and down and down and down. And about at this layer here, it builds up a lot of energy. And that energy doesn't disappear during the night. And that's why these lizards are able to stay at around 30 degrees C throughout the night, which is about, what is that, about uh, 70, 70, 80 or so? Yeah, so despite the temperatures dropping down to Sahara to about, it could be 50, 60, these animals are able to stay warm throughout the night and able to really control their temperature by moving through the sand levels. That's okay. So that's actually a lot of what our research into them, and that's why that one has the implant on his back, is to look at exactly where they're going in the thermal gradient overnight. I can actually show you an example of that. But we usually find them on this top layer here, but just the other night, actually, I came in to see them at night, and they were down in this bottom layer as well. What we have is we have a bin set up with temperature probes at different depths. And what you can see here, it's a little bit hard to read, but the takeaway message is that the further you get down in depth in the sand, the less fluctuation you see. And so you see the ones right on the surface get really, really hot and then go down at night. The ones that are already in the sand stay pretty stable. And so in other words, even during the hottest part of the day, if you're a lizard, you go a little bit underground, you can keep, uh, you can keep cool. And the flip side of that, like Ethan was saying, during the night when it gets really, really cold, you go a little bit under the sand, you can keep warm. Um, I was going to ask that. What exactly are you trying to study with this? Is it the research or? Um, so what we're looking at right now, and overall, my personal preference is do a lot more on these guys. They're really interesting animal. Want to learn a lot more about them. But to do anything, we need to make sure we can get these animals in environments where they'll behave naturally. And a big part of that with lizards and herps in general is temperature. So what we're looking at here is kind of their thermal, well, we've, we've looked at it before with the Vidaris. It's, it's something called their, their thermal optimum, thermal performance curve. So every, every lizard has a little curve that looks like this with the temperatures they prefer. So hot here, cold here. And temperatures and lizards in the wild like to sit kind of in this range here, would you say? Mm -hmm. right. So that's really important when you're, yeah, typically. Yeah. Um, and that's really important when, you're, when you want to keep these animals and get them to doing naturalistic things is you want them in that temperature because then they're gonna behave preferably and like they would in the wild. But we don't know that for these animals. So what we're doing is seeing when they run best, when they, what they like to sit in, what they like to dive best in. And this allows us to see what temperatures is best for them and what they naturally have in the wild and what they're gonna prefer. So we can then mimic here. And then if we wanna do something like say, figure out gender differences, study their interactions between sex genders, differences. sex differences, sorry, sex differences, figure out their interactions between the sexes, we can then do that once we have the, pre the preferable temperature. I'll jump in there a little bit. So what we're testing, the hypothesis that Ethan's describing is something called the thermal co-adaptation hypothesis. Now, the next kind of unit in class is going to look at thermal biology. We'll talk about this a little more. But the basic idea of this is that you have lizards thermoregulate, right? They can move in their environment and pick the body temperature they want to be at. The idea of this hypothesis is that the temperature that they pick to be at is a temperature that's good for their performance, meaning it's the temperature where they can maybe run the fastest so they can most efficiently digest food or whatever. And you want to test if there's a match there. And if there's not, that's kind of surprising. Why would an animal choose to be at a temperature that's not the best temperature for it to be able to do whatever thing it needs to do in the environment? And that, you know, maybe there's a constraint or maybe there's some other factors we're not considering. So it's something that's been tested in a lot of lizards. And in some cases, they find support for it. In other cases, there's not support for it, which begs these other interesting questions. We'll unpack that a little more in class, but just that, that and that's why we want to talk about this a little bit today, because it gets into the functional morphology, but then also ties into some of this thermal biology and how these guys are picking their thermal environment and how that then might relate to their ability to do certain things at a given body. Mm -hmm. Nice job, Ethan. Um, another thing, too, I want to show in their morphology is so you can see them here they move very serpentine like through the sand um, and you've seen it before as they dove down but a 
part of their morphology that's changed is their ability to do things like bend. So most lizards, would you say is correct to just to be able to bend their head for the most part, maybe a bit of midsection flexibility, a lot of tail flexibility. But these guys can do a full oh, like yeah. this. I, I mean, that's not uncommon. No? Yeah, yeah. Because when lizards run, often they run by kind of undulating at the yeah. same time. Uh, if you watch like a podarsis lizard run, it's, it's pelvic girdle, so its hip bones will kind of move back and forth to increase the length of its gait. But these guys are like primo at it. Yeah, they'll even, if you pick them up, that's the reason why we're not having people really handle them, is one, because this guy especially likes to bite. He's not going to do it now. But they will, and you can see how he's trying to escape from my hand as well, is they will just shake themselves like crazy, and they'll cause you to drop them, so. You can see it here as if I grab him, you can see him trying to bend his body. And he's actually quite, they're quite strong too with their muscles inside. They, they really are. And they will shake themselves out of your hand. Yeah. They're really good at that. And then too, like I said, their bite hurts a lot more than the uh, podarsis. They've actually got some, yeah. they've got some sharp teeth too. So. <laughs> we tested that. Yeah. It's actually surprising this guy doesn't want to bite. So. Yeah. Dude, you're really trying to piss him off. <laughs> bite me, bite me. He's like, oh, you want to show me off? Yeah, he'll bite you when you're putting him back downstairs. He's like halfway trying to bite you. Pretend you're a cricket. Oh, my God. There he goes. Yeah. Oh, I didn't even break the camera over. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, oh, camera if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot to turn the camera there. So whoever was watching the video. Is like, you don't need to do it again, I don't think. There you go. I think it's because these guys, too, even just being in this room, they are a lot cold in their preferred temperature. Yeah. So these guys cool off really quickly. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> but yeah, this guy, especially, he'll, when he's hot, he'll he'll surprise you with it, too. So you'll be holding him like this, and he'll be turning like crazy to try and bite you. And we also, uh, just as a, another aside, we also have these guys marked via the visible implant yes. elastomer, the same stuff we use with the salamanders on the use side. And so we can identify them individually. Oh, here he goes. And this guy, does this guy have the VIE or no? Oh, there you go. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Who would have thought? Oh my God. Oh. Yeah, don't oh, dodge that. <laughs> um... Is that, is that what happened to VIEs? No, I only brought the ones from the left bin. The left bin. Yeah. That we were not mixing them up. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, yeah, what other questions do you have now, knowing that we'll get into the, the nitty gritty of the thermal biology in, in the coming weeks? Uh, what else, what other questions do you have for Ethan now? Where like, we got yeah. these guys out? Like, where and how do you get them? Do you just pick them up from a pet store? Um, they, so they used to be offered in some pet stores, especially over in Europe, um, from what I've been able to find. But now you need to get them from an importer, buy them online, and then have them shipped over, um, which can cost you like $100 for shipping and stuff, because it's just a live animal, so. Yeah, yeah they're pretty reasonably priced. Yeah, no, it's like $20. Yeah, it's really good, so. yeah. Just $100 for shipping. Yeah. Oh, I should look at an interesting thing we found with these guys, too, in their diet, and that we're trying to, we might try to figure out at some point, but even though it's the Sahara, and it seems like it's kind of a, a normal kind of season, like one season all the time. There are differences uh, yeah. in, um, uh, like, uh, what would you call it? Uh, precipitation. Precipitation, that's it. And that will cause different plant matter, different animals throughout the year. And these guys actually go into a form of kind of, as you know it as like a hibernation type thing, where they're still going to be active, still out and about. But for the entire month of January, they found that they won't eat a thing. And they'll eat a little bit in February. And then after that is when they're going to start eating. So Why? we've all felt that way after the holidays, <laughs> we're just like, I'm gonna eat anything. Because there's just no food available and they can go in such a way and they'll just sit in the sand and they'll just like act normally. Oh, I should have mentioned too their vibration section. Oh, yeah, um, that's a cool and they just won't do anything and they'll be able to survive without eating anything for a month or more. Um, and then that's the thing too, I forgot to mention about these guys is grab another one here. Uh, so living in the sand. And swimming in the sand and being your whole life under the sand prevents pre, uh, presents an opportunity uh, a disadvantage for prey detection, especially for a diurnal species like this. Hunting through the day re requiring movement to see and uh, to hunt. But this species has come up with a unique way of getting around that 
where in the sand, they can detect any vibration in the sand as well. If you, if you're meters away and you move a couple, or I think it's a couple feet away, and you move even a grain of sand, they can sense it and detect it. And they will use this to tell when a prey item is coming by. If it's a prey item, if it's a predator, whatever it may be, they can tell what's coming by and then emerge. And then from there, they can even locate so that if there is, so this is the skink here and there's a little insect moving over here, it can then rotate it to move and tell where the, the prey is and then emerge and then come out and then hunt for the, the insect or whatever the prey item may be. They, they even found with these guys too, um, other lizards in their stomachs as well. So anything that they are able to get a hold of, they will eat. Plenty of eating. Yeah. So like, if you're just like moving around the sand a little bit, are they likely to come up at all? No. So as soon as they sense any sort of vibration that's human related, they will not do anything. How do they know it's human related if it's just like, like a finger or something? Just by the way patterns move. So when you have a little insect in there, it'll be moving in a specific way. Its legs will undo, like, the, the pattern of the vibrations and the pattern of particles moving will be a certain pattern that they can recognize that, oh, that's a prey item, that's a predator. So if they feel if they hear, they hear feel something that's slithering and moving continuously, it could be another sand skank, it could be a, a serpent that's gonna hunt them and kill them, it could be any sort of prey item. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool, we'll, we'll, we'll get into it more. Let's, uh, let's hear a round of applause for Ethan who presented and set up a bunch of stuff for us. Thank you, that's really great. Um, Let's do this. Let's just keep the skinks uh, just here for a minute. I'm going to get the next part of class going and we take a break. We can bring them back downstairs. Yeah, They'll be okay for another 20 minutes or so. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, uh, let's transition here. I'm going to go back and share the screen on the video recording. Go back here. All right. So actually, this is the original title slide I had for today's lecture. Ethan asked me not to put any sand skin pictures up to start so we didn't uh, spoil the surprise. But you can see a nice shot of one there. Will, would you mind grabbing the lights? I just want to point out to you. Yeah, please. See the yellow scale on the guy there, too, that we're still confused. Oh, yeah. Right here, you can see it really nice. You would guess as a male as well, due to the black and yellow as well. That's a nice shot there, courtesy of Google Image Search. Um, cool. All right, so today's agenda looks like this. Um, I've got a herpetology in the news for you today. And then, well, we actually split these two. We already did the, the, the Santa Sphinx stuff. So we already covered that. Um, it's a nice way to bridge our discussions of functional morphology with thermal biology a little bit. We've been out for a while. I want to make sure we have time today to debrief our field trips. Uh, there actually should be field trips, plural, because we have three of them now. Talk about the species we saw, give you some background information and um, uh, a little more knowledge about everything that we saw. Frog calls, we're gonna learn some frog calls today, so get your ear drums ready. Um, and then if we have time, we're going to go back and analyze our data from our in-class podiasis experiment from 400 years ago. Um, so we're gonna revisit those ideas. I don't know if we're gonna have time for that today. We'll see how things go. If not, we can get to that on Wednesday. Then we'll just give some wrap ups and reminders. Before we dive into it, I wanna remind you that for your program today, the one thing I did ask you to do is complete your outing reflection for the, um, the salamander coverboard uh, visit on Monday. That's due today. So we um, again, I'm asking for those 48 hours after whatever trip we take. Um, and we are gonna talk in a little more detail about that salamander study next week. Athena, who's been involved with the project for more than a year now, has it been a full year? Really just since August? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it feels like it feels like longer. Um, not in like a bad way, you know, like in a good way, right? Because you say it feels like forever now. Um, yep, so Athena's gonna talk about that in a little more detail next week. So I won't talk about the salamander study in too much detail today, but we'll just talk about the I want to focus on the species that we saw and a little bit of their natural history and then wrap things up. Uh, one thing, and I actually just have this before class, so I don't have a slide uh, for it, but I want to just share this information so you can get it on your calendars. Uh, guess what I scheduled, guys? A field trip to go see mud puppies. Yeah, so that is going to be on uh, Wednesday, uh, 20 April. <laughs> supposed to rain something that day. All right, so the 20th of April, uh, we'll do it during class time and then in the evening again. The same as we tried to do before. I think this is take five. 
Um, I will provide details as we get closer. I'll have a slide and everything, but just to get that on your calendar, uh, if you want to go that evening, uh, will be fun. So we'll go during class again, be back right around four o'clock and we'll go again. Cool. Any other questions before I start in herpetology in the news in today's lecture, what questions do you have? This one, yeah. uh, I need to confirm with you probably the same as we were planning last time, probably about 730 because it'll be late because it's they're nocturnal. So we'll get out there at night, but I will I'll confirm that but tentatively. We'll say we'd leave here at 730. All right, herpetology news. Here's a cool one. This came out this uh, couple months ago. Anoles breathe underwater. So I want to dedicate this one to my friend Princeton Vaughn, who likes anoles. Um, so many species. So anoles are the most uh, the genus Anolis, uh, Prince, would you mind writing over the word Anolis on the board down there? Is an incredibly speciose genus of lizards that includes what 400 something species. It may be even one of the most speciose uh, genera of vertebrates, if I recall correctly. Um, and this includes many species that live along streams and waterways, um, specifically in the in the neotropics. And they frequently dive when they're startled. So what they do is they hang out over branches that are over the water. And if they're startled or threatened by predators, they'll just drop into the water. And so a lot of them are pretty good swimmers. Um, but some of them, a number of species, uh, can form a bubble uh, when they go underwater. And they can essentially use this bubble as a kind of like external breathing apparatus. It's really cool. They can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide uh, with the water through the bubble which allows them to stay underwater for longer. And specifically, some of them can stay underwater for up to 18 minutes. Now, the record for staying underwater for reptiles is, is much, much, much uh, longer than this. But considering um, their active metabolism and that they're doing this in the tropics when it's warm, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, just as an aside, anyone have a good guess at what the uh, record is for, for reptile staying underwater? Hours, yeah. eight, hours. eight hours, longer, longer, Three days. longer, oh months, months, like four months or longer than that. Wouldn't even know exactly. Painted turtles hibernate at the bottom of of waterways. Yeah, and they can they can they can circulate some uh, exchange some gas through the soft tissues in their cloaca, so they they breathe through their butts. Uh, it's true. Uh, limited, I mean, it's not exactly what it sounds like. It's not like they're taking a breath, but they can, they can perform gas exchange through that tissue. And because it's so cold and metabolism drops, they can remain underwater submerged for months and months at a time. One thing that's really cool is one of the problems that, that us vertebrates have when we hold our breath for a long time is not necessarily the lack of oxygen, but the buildup of carbon dioxide. Turtles can buffer that carbon dioxide in their bloodstream uh, by pulling bicarbonates from uh, body tissue that they have in great abundance, especially compared to other verte vertebrates. Um, do you know what tissue they can pull bicarbonates from? Bone, yeah, they've got a ton of bone because they have a big bony shell. So uh, really cool, they can pull minerals from that bone, use that to buffer the acidosis of the carbon dioxide building up in the blood, and that can, can contribute to their being able to stand in water for months and months and months. So the painted turtles look at these and those in like 18 minutes, I can breathe out my butt, sucker. But you know, it's really cool to be able to do that. And what's more fascinating about this study is, um, uh, well, here's a quote from the study. And the researcher, one of the researchers said, we suggest that hydrophobic skin, so remember hydrophobic, all of you learned this in probably chemistry one or biology one twenty, right? You talked about hydrophobic, hydrophilic, lipid, bi uh, uh, bilayers and all that stuff. Okay, so these are molecules that do not uh, mix well with water, and so they have hydrophobic skin, which we observed in all sampled anoles may have been exaptive, facilitating the repeated evolution of specialized rebreathing in species that regularly dive. So who remembers what exaptation was? Princeton, would you mind putting that up there? Exaptation, go ahead. Eat. Something, but it's not meant for that issue, but it just so happens to work for that issue as well. Yep, in the right direction. Catherine, do you want to add to that at all? Um, I'm going to say actually, they're both. 
Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great answer, guys. Both of you combined. So you know your your nose uh, evolved to uh, uh, provide an air passageway for air to to clean it and to warm it and to humidify it as it comes into your lungs. Also important for olfactory senses, right? Also happens to work really well as a holder for your eyeglasses. Didn't evolve for that, but it works for that. So you can make an argument that the nose is ex an ex adaptation or acceptation, excuse me, that's hard to say, acceptation uh, for glasses wearing, for example. And there's actually, that's there's the reason I'm giving that as an example is there's a whole, like this uh, kind of controversy in evolutionary biology from several decades ago when they use that as an example. I won't get into that, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so they're saying they had this hydrophobic skin already, so that made them really easy for them to use this characteristic uh, for this other purpose other than what it was evolved for. And what's cool about this study um, is that they found that it evolved independently in a number of anole lineages. So here's a phylogeny of anole species. It doesn't really matter what species are what. Um, what you can see here is the light blue are anoles that used what they call occasional rebreathing of, of, um, from the bu a bubble that forms. And the ones in blue are really good at it. They use the sustained rebreathing. And the takeaway message from this is that those dark blue dots are not clustered. So it's not just that like one clade evolved this trait and used it. It's that it evolved repeatedly across species that aren't particularly closely uh, related evolutionarily. So cool stuff. I provided a link to both a very short uh, article on the web about this research paper and a link to the original paper in your class program for Wednesday. Remember, you can expect to see questions about this on quizzes and exams. The questions will focus on what we talked about in class. Uh, you know, I provide the extra materials there so you can reference them, but I'm not going to ask you like some obscure question from the research paper. It'll be on something we just covered here. Cool, cool. Anything else you want to add about breathing, rebreathing? So, like when I think about it, I've never, I don't know, this is a dumb question, but like when I you put a bucket over your head and go in the water, uh -huh. and then it creates an air bubble mm -hmm. inside the bucket. Mm -hmm. Is that essentially what it is? It's actually very similar to that, uh, except the difference is, is that the bucket, uh, there's no gas exchange between the air in the bucket and the water. And so what that bucket does is it gives you a little more volume of air that you can breathe from, right? But when you build up carbon dioxide in that bucket of air and you take all the oxygen out, then you're just kind of stuck with what you have. What's cool about this little bubble here is that that gas can exchange with the water across there. So it can actually, uh, the, the carbon dioxide can leave the bubble and go into the water and oxygen from the water can go into the bubble. So it's like a, a bucket, um, it's like a breathable bucket almost, right? It's like the bucket 2.0, like even better. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a great analogy. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a really kind of important clarifying point. About oh yeah, it was yeah, all the time, yeah. Uh, not recently, though, <laughs> admittedly, but I will next time I go swimming. Yeah, I've said it one time before, and people are like, you're crazy, but... <laughs> I mean, you take the bucket off, you'd be, it's not like you're going to stay in there. Well, yeah, it's cool. I'm, I'm, I, I hear you. <laughs> Other questions? All right, let's go back and uh, talk. I'm going to debrief our field trips a little bit, and maybe I'll start. I'll talk for a little bit here, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll get back to it. Uh, the first thing I want to respond to some of your questions. Now, these are just questions that you wrote in your surveys for the first field trips last week. I didn't get to the ones, well, they're just due today for the uh, field trip from Monday. Uh, so the first thing, this came up over and over again. People were really surprised that the frogs were so small, uh, the chorus frogs and the peepers. And the answer is they're small because they're small. Uh, I think we have a stereotype of like frogs being a certain size, but lots and lots of frogs are really small. Um, it's a pretty typical size for a frog. And in fact, probably the majority of frogs are small, uh, as we would see here. I think what's particularly surprising is how dang loud they are for their body size. I think that might have surprised a lot of us, too. Um, but yeah, a lot of frogs are that size. There's some that get quite bigger. The goliath frog, I think, is the biggest one. Is a big, meaty fellow. Bullfrogs actually get pretty enormous, too. Um, but by and large, frog species tend to be on the, on the smaller size. And by small, I mean about the size of those chorus frogs and peepers. Um, one question came up is why do we see more organisms at night? Uh, the answer is a lot of what we're looking at is nocturnal. And so especially those chorus and, and peeper, chorus frogs and peepers, they're primarily uh, calling at night, although obviously not exclusively, as you heard. The, the spotted salamanders come out to breed only at night. 
And so that's why we saw more of them at night. Having said that, I've seen mole salamanders during the day. Um, you know, there's some of these things are so active during the day, but especially this time of year, they're gonna be uh, nocturnal, which is why we had uh, such good luck. And also the site we were at in the evening, Stratford, we were there because we know there's a lot of salamanders there and we're there specifically to see them. So it's, you know, kind of a targeted um, outing as well. Uh, someone asked, are there salamanders at Gallant Woods? So the site we visited during the day. This is a great question. I mentioned this a little bit on our trip. That looks like fantastic salamander habitat for me. I have never seen a salamander there. I actually go to that place all the time. Uh, it's close to my house. I like to go up there and go running and stuff. And uh, I, I flip logs all the time and I've never seen a single salamander there. And I couldn't tell you why that is. It could have to do with historical land use. It could be there and I could be unlucky. Um, there's some several wetlands there that I would be shocked if there weren't spotted salamanders, um, but I've never gone out there at night. So uh, what's important here is we didn't see any salamanders, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. Yeah, what do you think? I was yeah. About, like, we'll have you try yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, uh, what, what is it? Lack of evidence of presence is not evidence of lack of presence. I butchered that, but you get the idea. Just because we haven't seen them, that doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, let's see, other question that came up. Oh, is there a good herpetology uh, app? Herp Mapper is a good one. So let me just actually, I have a couple websites here I wanna share with you. Give me one second to pull this up. Is that over here? Yeah, perfect. And so this is an app you can download. There's a, there's a cool Amphisbanian for you. Look, these guys are wild. They have like these little front legs. They don't have any rear legs. They're super weird. Um, there's a Sicilian for you. And so you can, so this is similar to iNaturalist in some ways, although iNaturalist is for her too, right? You can, it's for anything. It's for anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and this is a nice one specific to herps. I've logged some stuff on there, uh, but I haven't recently, um, but you can use that. It's just, what is it? Herpmapper.org. I also want to share with you, this is related, um, uh, but doesn't necessarily answer this question. A good friend of mine actually just put this together, uh, last month. It's really pretty cool. He's a salamander guy. Um, and some of you met him. So this is Andy Kramer. Uh, some of you, meaning one person, you met him. We had lunch with him at the sick bee meeting. He's the guy that did work in the Galapagos on the snails and everything. Um, and so he put this little website together. So this uses uh, data and an interface through R. And what you can do is go county by county and it can tell you where you can find salamanders in a given state. So let's say, what's your favorite salamander? I'm gonna pick on Lennon. Lennon, what's your favorite salamander? Uh... <laughs> let, him, let him pick, Lennon, this is you, man. We wanna know. <laughs> Look at, you've got, you've got just a few options. You want me to read the names for you? <laughs> Green salmon. What is uh, Eurasia? No, that's a Eurasia. Uh, what's the what's the Latin for green salmon? I don't know. It's a, it's a, 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 oh, Aeneides. Uh, let's see here. Okay, we're gonna go with that. Aeneides. Aeneas. Okay, a uh, green salmon. It is. Uh, we're gonna go. We're gonna go all of them, right? There's not too many. Uh, and you can see on the map here where they're abundant uh, or absent. Excuse me, in blue, and then more common in red. And then if you wanna go visit Wisconsin and see salamanders, he's from Wisconsin, that's why it's the default. You're not gonna see any, but let's say we wanna to go to, what's down here, let's see. Uh, we can go here and it's gonna say, Seaver County is where we go see green salamanders in Tennessee. Isn't that cool? A uh, little more local, let's try um, Pythodon cenarius. I can just reload this, it'll come up. And then let's say we're in Ohio, because he wants to go to Wisconsin. <laughs> um, and then we're going to go to Cuyahoga County. Um, and you can go, I think there's a way you can zoom in on the map too. Anyway, this shows you all the diversity of all these, these uh, species of salmonids from North America. So if you're interested in this, you can look at their range. But this is actually a nice map for us to, to think about the uh, project we did on Monday, talking about how we have the exact same uh, experimental design with the cover boards at a number of sites across their geographic range. And you can see Plethodon scenarios have a huge range across here. And there's sites from down in Maryland, up here, I think there's one in Maine, there's a bunch of Massachusetts, through Pennsylvania, and then we're in here in Ohio. So 
Close up. Yep. Uh, where did he get these data from? Uh, I don't know where he's pulling the data from. A database of distributions. Uh, knowing Andy, he's using something that's been verified. Oh, here we go. Uh, global biodiversity information facility data. Um, so yeah, so reliable sources. Do you think it's I don't know. I mean, for some species, I'm sure it might be, but yeah, I don't know. It's possible for sure. I mean, range maps are constantly being updated. I was going to ask the same thing. How do we get all that data? What if it's from like a Google Earth or something? Yeah, there's lots of databases out there where you can track. Usually, usually it's county by county if uh, species are cited and and that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With varying degrees of reliability, of course. Oh yeah, there is a species of on that. Uh, well, it's, it's I, I'm actually I didn't realize it was actually considered scenarius, but it's down there. Huh? I didn't even notice that at first. Yeah. I don't. There's some like geological story about why we have like Pelophodon scenarius down in wherever this is, Arkansas. There are some like yeah. in Washington that there's some species that are colonies, but basically right. Yeah, that happens in place. I mean, bullfrogs are a good example of this guy's moving west. But, uh, let's see. Can you search by, um, uh, instead of the species, just the state, and figure out like, what sort of species are included in that state? Uh -huh. so, well, here's salamander diversity of Ohio. So this shows you where the most diverse counties are in the least in terms of salamanders. Uh, is there a way to zoom in on that in more detail? I don't see one here. Right, so that's that's what I'm showing here. So you, uh, I'm clicking on Ohio. This map shows you the diversity of salamander species that live in Ohio. So the red is more species than less species. But what is not on here is the ability to right now, from what I'm seeing, is like see that list and more details of it. <laughs> no, because I clicked on this tab up here. So it's salamander diversity versus species distributions. Yep. So salamander diversity. So there's more to it. He just it just came out like last month. Yeah. And he just did it kind of for funsies. Yep. I, I don't know if this is significant at all, but I'm noticing that on this map right here, mm -hmm. the area with the least salamander diversity is the area that used to be the great black swamp. That's that was drained a while ago. Up here? Yeah. Hmm. There used to be a really big swamp up there that that in Indiana. And so, so I wonder if the lack of salamander diversity there is due to the swamp being drained. And so there hasn't been new species yeah. sort of going back into that area. That would make great sense. I don't know the detail of that area of all, but that would certainly fit. <coughs> you know what? Because I'm from the area. Like a lot of the farms and places have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of. So it's yeah, it's super. Like when I went out, yeah. like I went out there for spring break. There's an example of a species of salamander called the four toed salamander, mm -hmm. uh, which has been found there at a park in downtown. Well, you know, it was super urbanized, it was like kind of the last one. It was found there once in like the 90s, it wasn't found before, and it hasn't found since. Mm -hmm. So it's just a super understudied area that's like nobody looking at it, it's not really many. Well, there's a couple actually. There you go. Yeah, that's do it. I have found salamanders in my backyard in Texas. I live in a county where like most of the species they say there's like none on the actual like Ohio. Uh huh. Yeah. You find them, and that's you can actually document that the like the the for example the journal the Herpetological Review that I've talked about a little bit. They every issue they publish like this whole list of like new county records of herps, and if you have like a photo voucher and you can document that you saw it, they can put that information with folks that keep track of this stuff and that'll be in the next edition of the amphibians of Ohio or whatever. So, yeah, keep track of that. Go ahead. Yeah, do you know like female aspects or like posting a blackboard or something for those Yeah, I don't actually I didn't put them in your class program, but I will um I'll make a note to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Uh, you know what I'll do is I'll put it in the notes for the video. So when I upload the lecture video and like YouTube it has the notes, I'll just put it in there because it'll be so simple because um, one last question that came up was, oops, do frogs see us as a threat? And I said, absolutely. Uh, anything big and, and moving at them, the frogs see as a threat. And that's why they stop calling during the day when you get close. They, they absolutely know you're there. 
uh, and they know you're coming and they don't want to be around you. Let's take a break um, and then I'll talk about some stuff here. I don't know if we're going to get to the analysis today, but that's okay. Um, let's take, uh, what is it? Let's take five. We need, we deserve a five minute break. Let's go to 10 after on that clock and we'll get back to it. All right, let's go ahead and get back to it. I didn't realize uh, how late we were. That break was just kept going and going and going. Uh, next segment of class here, I want to talk about what uh, reptiles native to Ohio, excuse me, reptiles and amphibians native to Ohio um, in more detail. And this is part of the class curriculum from the beginning and the, going back and debriefing our outings and talking about um, what we saw is uh, kind of a natural springboard for that. So in Blackboard right now, I put up two PDFs of these very short guides to the reptiles and amphibians of Ohio put out by the Division of Wildlife. They're okay, they're useful, uh, they're free, and they provide just a nice quick overview of some of the species native to Ohio, what counties you can expect to see them in, a little bit about their natural history. I have paper copies here and there's PDFs up in Blackboard. So you can check those out. Those will be great references for the stuff that I'll cover in class uh, today. One thing I will say that has jaded me against these is on the reptiles guy on the page for the wall lizard, Podarsis morales, they have a photo of some other lizard species that is not Podarsis morales. And that irks me a little bit as, as, but that, as you can imagine, uh, yeah. So those are up, uh, use them as resources. We're gonna talk about these species, their natural history, and I want you to know the stuff we're talking about. And so those are kind of extra study guides or if you're curious about other species. Go ahead, Michaela. Are you sure that all the other ones are as far as I know, they're fine. Yeah, but we you know that was something like that just makes me. Yeah, I, well, yeah, I, I know the state herpetologist. So I'm going to, he'll get an earful. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you want to say anything about like, the range of might not be set too. Yeah, I mean, the range maps in here, as always, are, are dynamic. And so as people make new observations or as things um, aren't observed for long periods of time, this one doesn't have, oh yeah, this one does have the county maps. Um, you can see that. I pulled, it's funny, I pulled up the page for the Northern Green Frog to see if it had the county by county map and the whole state of Ohio is just green. And I was like, oh, that must not have the county by county map, but that's actually the county by county map. They're just found in every county in the state. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you can, those things are always changing. This new, um, well, there's the reptiles of Ohio book and then the amphibians of Ohio book. These are obviously more authoritative guides. Like this covers the same species as this, obviously in a lot more detail. And these I've been leaving in the classroom. If you really want to get in depth, you can check those. Yeah, they're really good. And the, the reptiles one is brand new as in like uh, less than a year old at this point. So. Cool, so those are up there. So what I expect you to know about the species we're gonna talk about is their uh, Latin and common names, what family they're in, and then a bit about their natural history uh, that we'll talk about here today. So I'm gonna go through and just cover first and foremost the species we saw on our outings this past week. Um, first, I'm gonna start with reptiles and talk about the Northern Brown Snake, Steraria decayi. This is in the family Colubridae. Um, so remember, that's a really large family of snakes. And specifically, in this family, they're in a subfamily that's called Matrosinae. And this, this uh, subfamily includes some really, really common snakes. Garter snakes, water snakes, queen snakes, grass snakes, etc., are all in this subfamily. And so a lot of uh, the species that we'll see are in this subfamily. Garter snakes are probably the most common snake around. Um, the two species that we find down in the Delaware Run, the northern water snake and the queen snake, or the, yeah, the queen snake are in the same subfamily. Uh, these guys are small, generally docile, unless you're chased, apparently. Uh, I've never been bit by one, uh, so I'm really surprised that you got tagged, uh, but I bet it didn't hurt at all. Uh, they're so tiny in their teeth that so you weren't bleeding or anything, right? No, it didn't bite me. It just came at me. It just came at you. Okay, but it didn't actually get you. Ah, okay, that's a good thing. Um, you can tell they have some distinguishing, they're generally not like this kind of brown or grayish uh, color, and they have this dark uh, ventral stripe behind the eye to the mouth. So right here, you can see this stripe is an identifying feature, and they also have a large spot uh, just um, uh, kind of 
inferior, just below the eye there. Um, and they have this kind of color pattern. I described it here as a pale mid dorsal stripe bordered on each side by parallel rows of dark spots. Um, it's basically easy to see the visual there, although admittedly that's not the greatest uh, picture. They also have these keeled scales. So we talked about sc scales being smooth or keel, and they have a divided anal plate. I talked about that a little bit as a distinguishing character. I'm not really so concerned that you know these two things. I'm uh, just kind of presenting some general identifying information about them. Um, but I would like you to be able to identify them from a photo. And um, in the case of some of the animals we looked at, uh, identify them by ear. But I'm not gonna ask you to identify a brown snake by ear. And you remember we saw four of these at the um, at Gallant Woods. And so I got a nice picture. I actually like this picture a lot. One of these guys, you can see the color pattern and uh, the line, this distinguishing black line right here with our feet in the background. So Steraria decayi, northern brown snake. Mm -hmm. Will you ask us like how we knew what individual it is? Like, think, like look for things like, oh, it had a vertical stripe behind the eye to mouth, so I knew it was the case. Yeah, my, you know what I should have done? Shoot, we have some of these in the museum. I should have brought museum specimens to go correspond with this lecture. If I was a better professor, I would have done that. Just thought of it now. We might have some. Princeton, why don't you take a look in the chat and see if there's anything relevant in there? If they're down in the museum, I don't want to get up to well, I think we actually have some in the center. There's like a brown thing. So go ahead and grab it. These ones are unidentified. Yeah, we'll take a look in there, actually. Uh, yeah, we have some here actually. None of them are in there. So no, they won't be. We have some more things. That's I thought maybe for a second yes in here. Those are unidentified for a class project. Yeah, which we may or may not get to this semester. Uh, so there's your brown snake. The other reptile we saw is the painted turtle, Chrysemys picta. This is in the family Amidae. So this is the large family of. Uh, freshwater turtles that includes a lot of pond and stream turtles. Some of the most conspicuous ones that you can see out basking and stuff like that. Uh, the painted turtle is so called because of these bright colors of its plastron. Remember we have turtles have carapace and a plastron. Carapace is the top shell, plastron the bottom. These guys are very conspicuous, meaning they're very easy to see. They have a huge geographic range. Uh, and what's kind of interesting about them is they can live in really marginal habitats. Habitats that don't look like they'd be great, ideal, natural environments. Muddy ditches on the side of the road, polluted ponds behind buildings, stuff like that. Uh, they seem to be able to do pretty, pretty well with that. Their carapace is generally dark green or black and doesn't really have many colors, but then you see these bright color patterns on their plaster in there, as well as the underside of these marginal scutes of their, of their characters, right? Um, also, you can see the front hands and feet have these yellow stripes that uh, allow you often to identify them from a distance. And we saw one or two of these guys basking up at Gallant Woods. If we go out there on a nice warmer day, if we went out there this afternoon, we'd probably see a, a group of them hanging out on the logs, catching some rays. They, they bask a lot. Yeah, uh, I saw another hand over here. Is that you, Sam? Did you have a hand up? No, Sam, 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 Sam. Question? I'm gonna ask you to go back. Okay. Obvious. Yeah, and we'll go, I mean, I, I'm not asking you to know every single detail on here and you can go, lecture is recorded, so you can go back and get it. I'm gonna keep keep moving for right now though. Ethan, go ahead. Um, as right here, so a very similar facial pattern. What are some things you look for? Like, see these guys out in the wall, like some kind of distance, some kind of like close, but not super close. You can identify the difference. These yellow stripes primarily in the red eared slider, you can see that red mark behind their eye. If you can't see that very well, you can kind of tell by the shape of the shell. So, so you say, sometimes I use the line on their back of their Therapist, would you say uh, that's a good one? No, well not these guys don't have that line. The midland painted turtles oh. do, but the ones here, the eastern painted turtles don't. Um, and I didn't distinguish eastern from midland here, but they, they don't that all painted turtles don't have that. So uh in Ohio, I don't think so. It's all the same species, it's different subspecies. Uh, I don't think the midlands are here. I think they're further west. I have to check on that. Yeah. The midlands? Yeah. I don't know. I know the eastern, sorry. Oh, Easterns, the Easterns are here, yeah. I thought I was getting some in Ohio with that stripe down. Oh, really? Uh, I don't know, maybe. No. Catherine, go ahead. Yeah. 
these guys like they're, yeah you can see the underside of the carapace does have that they do all have that it kind of fades with age so this is a youngish turtle with really bright colors when you find ones that are old this gets faded and it's not so quite so vibrant kind of becomes yellow or grayish but that guy this is an especially pretty one my friend has a sweet painted turtle tattoo so those are the only two reptiles we saw. Frankly, I'm surprised we saw any on the day we went out. So that's aces. We'll see more, of course, as we move forward. And anything that we see in our outings, we'll present and talk about it here in more detail. All right, let's talk about uh, Herps, Pothodon cenarius, the red back salmon. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna update this right now. This is an important distinction. It's actually the Eastern red back salamander. There is a Southern red back salamander too. And now the front one over, oh, we'll have to live with that. Then the family Plethodontidae. Uh, remember that Plethodontidae are a huge family of salamanders that are lungless. These guys breathe through their skin. Uh, they're super abundant. I showed you the range map just a minute ago uh, in the Northeast US and Southeast Canada. Note that they are so abundant that in many places they are the most, um, by mass, they're the greatest density of vertebrates. So if you took all the salamanders, let's say in a square kilometer of a forest and weighed them, that cumulative mass would be more than any other vertebrate in the area. So your deer, bears, or whatever, they'd outweigh them all. So they're friggin' sweet. Um, they have a very elongated body. So you can see these on the Catherine's photos from our outing the other day without her permission. Oh, you'll see more of these come up. I didn't ask anybody's permission, but I gave you credit. That's like half okay. <laughs> Um, very elongated body, and you can see in many cases the tail is is very fat, and in some cases even longer than their body from their snout to their um, their vent. And we saw some examples of that the one I was uh, processing on Monday. Um, also, notice that they have uh, different color morphs that are called either striped or lead back. So here's two Plethodon scenarios at the same site. You can see this guy has this bright orange stripe down his back. This one up here too whereas this guy doesn't have either. They've done a whole bunch of studies trying to understand why this color variation exists, if it's tied to climate, et cetera. The short answer is, I don't know. Uh, it's been researched extensively. There's one study that showed that it might have to do with uh, their thermal, their ability to withstand and, and be active at different temperatures, but that wasn't sustained by other research. And so we're not really sure why these color polymorphisms exist, but they do. And we see them at our site. We saw some on Monday that were uh, striped and some that were like that. And they're so pretty, look at this little cute guy. It's adorable, right? All right, so that is one salamander we saw, yeah? Do you want to know if animals like this have to um, suck them? No, not unless I talk about it explicitly here. Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. Uh, all right, spotted salamander. Here's a photo from a can I use without permission, uh, but credit was given. Uh, Ambistema maculatum. So this is the spotted salamander in the family Ambistematidae. This family is commonly referred to as mole salamanders because they like to live underground. So they don't go into water much, except when they're breeding. We were fortunate enough to see some of that action uh, last week, but they're mainly terrestrial. And they... Um, have this very conspicuous color pattern, right? They're so-called uh, spotted salamanders because they've got these really bright yellow spots on like a grayish, blackish, bluish background. Um, it's really amazing how kind of conspicuous that color pattern is. I have here that they do not have the nasolabial groove. So some species of salamander like your Cuthodon, they have this groove that runs from their nostril down to their mouth. And it's important, especially in um, mating and, and pheromones actually can, can produce their pheromones externally to um, attract mates and things like that. These guys have them, the mole salamanders don't attract their mates in other ways, other mysterious ways. And I've got a nice photo here, this one. Uh-oh, I didn't give credit to this. Wait, this is McKenna also, because I have McKenna, that's yours, right? Yeah, this is a great one. I just love how you can see the full tail and this is starts to go down the whole tail. Notice here you can see these costal grooves really prominently. Those are the grooves along the body where the ribs are. You can see it right there. Plus it on scenarios, you can see it uh, pretty well too, but not quite as well kind of right in here. 
And you can actually count in some species, count the number of those crossover groups, and that helps you uh, delineate one species from another. Let's see what else. We also had the good fortune of seeing a smallmouth salamander. So this is in the same family of Ambistomatidae or the mole salamanders. Um, Ambistoma texanum um, is the smallmouth salamander. I, I don't know why I always remember this because like Texas is big, right? Everything in Texas is big, but these guys have a small mouth. So somewhere in my brain, these are like the, the irony salamanders. Um, they are very similar in body shape to the spotted salamanders. Um, except they don't have spots. They have this brown or grayish uh, background color and their eyes are really close to their snout and it gives them this appearance of having like a small mouth basically, hence their name. You can also see they have these very prominent costal grooves uh, similar to the spotted salamanders, probably a little more uh, prominent even than the spotted salamanders. We saw exactly one of those at Stratford, the picture here. Uh, I think I took this picture. That's why there's no credit there. Did I take, did someone else take this picture? Okay, okay. Um, this is a nice one of us with, I don't know whose hands these are, but someone's got a spotted salmon or someone's got a small off. Someone's taking a picture of the two of them. Uh, very cool, we got to see both of them together. So that's the three species of salamander we saw. I've got some frogs coming up for you and your frog, so get your ear holes ready, people. Spring peeper. So let's do this, let's just go ahead. These guys. Sound like that. They don't sound like that. So I am going to ask you to know frog calls by ear. Uh, and you will have a quiz on this uh, week from today. So I'll have information for you about that in the slide coming up. Um, but the, the, it's going to include just a handful of frog calls. And this is one of them. Today, Chris, Christopher, remember, Christopher comes from the word for uh, cross because they have this very prominent X on their dorsum. Um, these guys are in the family Hylidae. That's the tree frog family. But make sure you're, you're, you're not thinking of tree frogs as exclusively living in trees. Uh, these guys, along with the, the chorus frogs, I'll show you in a second, live primarily on the ground. They're very small, as you saw and we talked about, um, and usually they're the first frogs to call in the spring. I love the sound of them here. It makes me think that spring is on its way. And I've got this nice video taken by, oh, this was by me. Someone actually took a nicer video, but I could, I think Peyton took a really nice people frog video. I couldn't get it. Yeah, I couldn't get it to download from GroupMe. So I'm going to show you my second video here. This is like not the Oscar winning video. But you can see how they have this pouch just under their jaw that helps amplify that sound. Let me play that one more time without my finger in the way. So you can see an example of them calling there. Um, and then this is a photo from Ethan. You can see very nicely. This guy's pretty dark overall. You can see this X on his back very clearly in that image showing you uh, why they're called Sudacris crucifer. That's the paper. We also heard chorus frogs, of course. It sounds to me, it's like a giant comb and someone's running something along the tines of the comb, you know? Uh, this is the Western chorus frog, Sudacris triceriata. And remember, triceriata means three stripes. And you can see these prominent stripes down their back. Uh, these guys are small, uh, along same, about the same size as the peepers. And they have this kind of funny slender body that's really kind of pointy at the head. And you can see this, especially when you kind of pull their legs back to have this kind of trapezoidal shaped body almost. They like to live along bodies of water. They're not primarily aquatic, but they they are in and around water and their toes, uh, related to that, their toes are partially webbed. Let me play that song for you one more time.
And we heard these guys uh, both at Stratford and at Gallant Woods. Next, we have the leopard frog. These we did not see, but we did hear a leopard frog at the end of the evening um, at Stratford. And these guys have an amazing song. You can hear peepers in the background of this recording too, if you listen carefully. They sound like a goofy predator. Uh, like the predator was on a kid's show or something, I don't know. Uh, so with the babies, Pippians, uh, they're in the family Ronde. And until very recently, these guys were in, uh, the genus they were in was Rana, R-A-N-A. -A. Uh, that genus got split into uh, two genera, Rana and Lithobates, with frogs from Europe and the old world sticking in the genus Rana and the new world frogs now in the genus Lithobates. Uh, although some people uh, don't really like that and they still call these guys Rana Pippians. So you might see Rana Pippians in some of the old literature, some folks stuck with that. I'm cool with lithobates, but not everybody is. Uh, they have these very conspicuous dark spots on a green background. Um, and they have, there's some patterns of the spots that can help delineate them from similar looking frogs in the same genus, like the pickerel frog. I'm not gonna worry about that too much right now. They do have these dorsal lateral folds. We talked about this with the green frog as well. Um, and that's this line that goes right here from just behind the eye, basically down to the, the juncture of the hind limb in the body here. That's a distinguishing character. Um, green frogs have that also, whereas bullfrogs do not. And we'll see that um, in a little bit here. And then the inside of their thighs are like a white color, not a yellow. Again, that's not really important right now. That distinguishes them from some of the other similar looking species. What I want you to be able to take away from this is this color pattern, hence the name leopard frog, and then that call, of course, as well. Sam, you got your hand up? Just stretching. All right, so that is those guys. I'll play that one more time for you. I love that sound. Okay. Next, we have the bullfrog. Notice same genus, Lithobates Tetesianus in the family Ranidae as well. These guys we did not hear, but we did see uh, one example. For who is the frog spotter for this guy? Yeah, Alan spotted this guy. Uh, this is a picture, indeed, from <laughs> Gallant Woods during the day. We found one of these guys, a kind of smallish one. Um, they do not have those dorsolateral folds. So if I take that picture and I blow it up. Oh. That's what they sound like. There's notice there's no dorsolateral fold here. And this is why they're called the bullfrog. It sound a little bit like a cow. It's delightful. What's that, Sam? That is exactly why they're called. I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, this is embarrassing in a number of ways, but when I was a kid, I had a record player and I had little records. Yes, I had records. You guys know what those are. You got, you get, okay, thanks, Will. You got my back. And I had one, it was a 45. So it was like a small one. And one side of the record was just bullfrogs calling. And I used to love, I would sit in my room. I can like picture this, like sit in the room with my record player listening to bullfrogs. It's good. Look where I ended up. Uh, great. They also, uh, let's see, they have no dorsolateral fold, though they have this large tympani. So this is like their, their basically their eardrum. Um, you can't actually see it too great in either of those pictures. So you can see it pretty well in here. It's this large circle just posterior to the eye. And notice it's like the same size as the eye of bigger. So bullfrogs have a really large, um, this really large tymp uh, tympanus, singular tympani plural. No bullfrogs. That call is pretty distinct. I don't think you're going to mix up the bullfrog call with anybody, but I'll just play it again for you for, for funsies here. Yeah. Getting my boot. I get to play.
All right, I'll stop there. Um, those are all the species we saw. That's all the species I'm going to cover in detail. I have a few more frog calls I want to play for you. Um, but before I do, what questions do you have about these, what, seven, eight species that we saw? Sam, please. Great question, Sam. It's going to be these species plus four more that I'm going to show you in just a second. So it'll be what, what's that? Seven total, seven or eight? Mm -hmm. Eight. Right, yeah, Sam, go, or uh, Sid, go ahead. Um, when you give us the quiz, we need to know the size of the game along with the common name we're identified yes. to identify a frog call? Yes. Uh, nope, scientific name. Yep, absolutely. And the family. We got another scientific genus, species, and family for all these guys. McKenna, do you have a, did you have your hand up? Do you have a question? No. You sure? I'm sure. Okay, Ethan. Uh, oh, actually, never mind. It was about that. Okay. Yep, spring peepers are holiday. So your peepers and your chorus frogs are both holiday. Mm -hmm. Whoop. Here we go. Mm -hmm. I think the question is fun. Um, with the, the, because you said know the families with the call, but with general identifying, mm -hmm. with the brown state, you want us to know the, the subfamilies. Oh, Natrocena. Yeah, you should know Natrocena. That'll come up again. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. Uh, and I put that on there explicitly for that reason. Cold in this room, huh? Yeah, this room is, is always chilly. I don't know why that is. All right, I have four more frogs that are native to Ohio that we are possibly in going to encounter either in class or you may encounter on your own. And I wanna introduce those calls. The first is the Eastern Cricket Frog. So these guys are in the family holiday as well. Uh, Acris crepitans. And this to me sounds like somebody like shaking marbles or something in their hand. Uh, it depends on how long the clip is. Oh, yeah, I won't do that too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, for like this one, the call is like kind of the same for extended period of time, but for the leopard frog, I'd play it through. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the other one, next one is American toad. So this is actually a picture taken on the cover of my grandma's pool some years ago. Uh, these guys are in, in Amplexus. You can see the big female here, the male on top of her. Uh, Anaxorus, excuse me, Anaxorus americanus, the American toad. You will hear these guys within uh, any day now calling and they're around this area, certainly around Delaware. I hear them when I'm walking around. It totally sounds like a little spaceship. <laughs> Oh no, we heard them. We did actually hear some American toads. I forgot, I didn't think a slide for them. Um, at, when we were leaving Stratford, we heard them kind of across the field. I totally uh, forgot to include it in them. Pretty good. That's good. You hear them now, yeah. I love this, I, oh my gosh. There's fewer sound. I didn't have a record of these guys when I was a kid, but. <laughs> What's that? What do you get from purpose logical record? I don't know, dude, my mom got it for me in 1982 or something. This is this a long time ago. Uh, we didn't even we didn't even have cassette tapes then. <laughs> had a friggin' record. Oh, I'm not putting them on there. Uh, I'm not going to ask you families of these ones if I'm not including the families. I'm going to tell you the family though. Uh, Bufanidae, so the uh, generally the toad family for the American toad. I'm sure, little toad, a little like Jackson's <laughs> spaceship. Lennon. Ah, you tell me. Holiday. Yeah. Oh, you know what? To answer your question, where did would I get this? So my mom bought it for me when I was a kid. So that means that she almost certainly bought it at a garage sale. And that's oh. Yeah, I don't know. This one we've heard before. So remember the interview, the podcast we listened to at the beginning of the semester with Priya Nanjapa? Um, she's talking about like hearing these guys in the woods and thinking it was somebody screaming. This is Fowler's toad, Anaxorus fowleri, same genus as the American toad. So what family is it? 
Yay. I'll just let you enjoy this call for a little bit here. <laughs> I, I not today now. Yeah. Yeah, just it's totally like that. It so if I ask you which frog call is the most metal, Fowler Stone. What's the one in the background? I can't hear it right now. Is it, I can't hear it. You got good ears. All right, I got one more for you here, and that is the wood frog. Shut up, Fowler's Toad. Uh, that is the wood frog, Lithobates sylvaticus. So genus Lithobates, same genus as uh, your um, leopard frogs, green frogs, bullfrogs. So what family is that? No. Who said it? Granaday, yep, yep. This is your wood frog. These guys are out really early in the season. I have never heard them. They're in Ohio for sure. I have not heard them in this area. Yeah, totally. It sounds like someone's like trying to get their frog car going. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep. Yep. So Vaticus means wood. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, it means woods. Yeah. Yeah. Sylvania, really? Yeah. It's like Pennsylvania. It's like Penn's woods. Yeah. There's the wood frog. Um, yeah, it sounds a little bit like uh, either someone signing document Alan said or or uh, like trying to start a car. Like, what did what that what happened to the frog when he parked his car illegally? It got towed. <laughs> all right, that's all I got for you today. All right, we're gonna end with that. So, a couple announcements for you as we wrap things up. This is probably my favorite comic that I'll show you all semester. <laughs> Uh, that's actually my friend that has the painted turtle uh, tattoo sent me this for my birthday. I was, I was thrilled. I had, to, I had to share it with the class. Uh, you have a quiz a week from today. It's going to include functional morphology, local herp, so the stuff we just covered, and we'll have a section on frog calls. We will have a practice quiz on frog calls on Monday in class, meaning that I'm going to set it up just like a quiz. And I'm going to play frog calls, and you're going to tell me what they are, except you won't get graded on it. A good chance to just practice your skills and see where you're at. Uh, I got some questions here. Go ahead, Nebraska. Oh, this trick. I was just throwing you for loop. Uh, it is going to be April. Let's just fix it right now. Thank you for pointing that out. And then also, primary literature, is it due on Wednesday, or is it due? So what do you want to say? This is primary literature. Uh, you're a step ahead of me. I'll get right there. Yep, it's a good question. Uh, primary literature assignment. Thanks for asking, Nebraska. Is due on Monday, April 4th. Uh, we're going to workshop it in class on Monday. So bring, uh, if you can, bring a laptop because it'll be easier to do some workshopping and typing uh, as you do that. Most of you have got your article approved from me. If you haven't, for some reason, actually don't have the list in front of me who hasn't, uh, take care of that as soon as possible. Note that this information is on your class program for Monday as well. I have details about the primary lit assignment. I have details about the quiz. I have details about frog calls, et cetera. So make sure you check out uh, that class program for Monday. See lots of hands. Give me one second to make one more announcement. We'll do questions. Um, note that I will be back for regular open hours Monday as well. If you want to go over anything, uh, I'll be here in this room from noon to two. Questions, I saw Sam, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. So this is due before class on Monday. You're going to submit it via the Google form. All of that information is in the PDF of the assignment. But then in class, we're going to share it with each other and um, read each other's and provide some feedback on the summary section of that assignment. Mm -hmm. Sam. Is there a quiz? Uh, will that include the summer things that we Oh, good question. Um, I'm going to actually say I will make it focused and say it's just on what we covered since break. I talked a little bit about function, uh, functional morphology before break, but I think we'll focus on primarily what Princeton 
uh, covered and then what Ethan talked about today. Mm -hmm. Yep, we won't do any new material on Monday that'll be in your quiz. It'll only be on stuff basically through breakthrough today. Uh-huh, thanks for asking that question, Sam. Sam, you have a question? I'm just going for Sam, I'm just going down the Sam list. Really? Is your chance. Okay, uh, I saw another hand up, did another question? Yeah, I asked Kate, I'm sorry, yeah. Same question, okay. Cool, well, thanks everyone, that's it for class today. We'll see you all on Monday, have a great weekend. Thank <laughs> you.